ch 13. I'm ignoring all remarks. <laughs> what a want to preach tonight, do a little teaching actually from Matthew 13, and, uh, and I want us to uh, learn how to hear a sermon. That's what we're going to title this tonight, How to Receive a Sermon, How to Receive a Sermon, and we'll be in Matthew 13, 1 through 23. We need to be able to hear and understand the Word of God, and uh, we're going to encounter the parable of the sower here and learn some dispensational truth about the postponement of God's kingdom that he had promised Israel in the Old Testament and we're going to learn some new ways that Jesus began to teach in this chapter teaching by parables and then we're going to also see how that because he had been rejected of his people his own people Israel that now he begins a new direction and uh, a new way of teaching and so if he's doing a new way of teaching we need to have a method by where we can understand what he says and therefore we're going to talk about the proper way to receive a sermon let's begin to read in Matthew 13 verse number 1 the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside and great multitudes were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now we're going to get into the parable in a, in a moment, but first let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then I want to point out a couple of things about this scripture before we get into the actual lesson. Father, we pray that you would bless us, and Lord, uh, your people have gathered together here tonight. And Lord, a, a good crowd, and they're faithful to be in the house of God on Wednesday night. And Lord, uh, perhaps some people watching uh, on the internet. And Lord, uh, oh, how we need the word of God, all of us do. And I pray that you would uh, lead us tonight by the Holy Spirit to speak the things that would be helpful, encouraging, teaching, leading us in the right direction to understand the word of God and to apply it in our lives. And Lord, I pray that our ears and our hearts would be very, very receptive and be fluffy, tender, nutritious soil for the Word of God to grow in tonight. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to read those three verses again. We'll go into some of the other verses, but notice this with me. If you, I want to underline some of this. Notice in chapter 13, verse 1, it says, The same day went Jesus out of the house. Now, there are those who believe, the students of the Bible believe that Jesus went out of the house that day. Uh, if you read back in Matthew chapter 12, you see that Jesus has been talking to these Pharisees. He's been trying to win the scribes and Pharisees over uh, to him as Messiah, and they reject him. And in chapter 12, they soundly reject him. Hey, Matthew starts off in the very first chapter giving a genealogy showing that Jesus is the Messiah. Of, he's the king. He's the coming king. He has credentials, and uh, he presents his credentials in Matthew chapter 1, and the Pharisees and the scribes reject that. And then he begins to do miracles and healings, and they reject that. They want to see more signs, but they tempt him, and, and little by little in those first 12 chapters, in the first 12 chapters of Matthew, you see Jesus presenting himself as the king, and finally in the 12th chapter, the, the Pharisees, the nation of Israel as a whole, reject him and his kingdom. And so then, that's where we pick up right here in verse number 1. The same day he went out of the house. Some scholars say that going out of the house is symbolic or metaphorical for him walking away from the house of Israel. He's turning his back on those who turned their backs on him. And then it says that he went out of the house and sat by the seaside. Now in our Sunday night message, you'll remember that the sea was, was symbolic of mankind. And, uh, and here you see this same terminology. He sits by the seaside and begins to teach and the seaside being representative of the Gentile masses. 
Now, verse 2, notice there. And great multitudes were gathered unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Now, it was customary in those days for the, for the teacher to sit down as he taught. And this crowd's gathered up against him so tightly that he gets in a boat and pushes out to sea a little ways. And so then he's got a natural amphitheater there uh, so the people can stand and listen to him preach. Now, what's the reason? It says, notice in verse number 3, it says, And he spake many things unto them in parables. Now, a parable is not the same thing as an illustration. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher of London, said that an illustration is like a window. It lets in light. And so when a preacher is using an illustration, he presents a truth and then uses an illustration and the illustration makes the light come on and lets the light in, sheds light on that truth, and the hearer sees that truth more clearer, sees it clearer without the more. And then a parable is different. A parable is a story that hides the truth from one group and has some truth contained for another group. You say, well, why in the world would the Lord Jesus want to hide the truth from anybody? Well, that's a good question. And uh, we're, we're coming to that. These Jews, in chapter 12, they've come to their final rejection of the Lord Jesus. He's shown them over and over again that he is the king. And he has a kingdom for them. And they turn from him. They have crossed a deadline. In other words, they've sinned away their day of grace and their opportunity to hear the truth. They've said, we don't care what you say. We don't want to hear it. And Jesus says, all right, if you don't want to hear the truth, then I'll just speak to those who hear me from now on in parables. And those who have ears to hear will hear the truth. And those who have said, we don't care who you are. We don't want to hear it then to them that truth will fall on deaf ears. And that's where we are. The disciples would be able to receive the truth as he explained the parables. And those who had rejected him, those scribes, Pharisees, the, uh, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel as a, whole, as a whole have turned their back and they won't be able to hear anymore. In Matthew 13, 10, the disciple, it says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Verse 11, And it says there, He answered and said unto them, Because, underline that word because, He's going to give them an answer. Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, who? Who's the them? It's the ones who had already turned their back on him and they said, we don't care what you say, we don't want to hear it. Look up here. There are truths that God has for everybody who wants to hear. And sometimes we're a little negligent to listen when the word of God is being presented. So what am I talking about tonight? I'm talking about how to hear a message, how to hear the word of God, how to receive the word of God. And yet, right here, right here, in this service and in... And uh, in church services all across the nation tonight, there will be some people, listen to me, there will be some people who say, I don't care what he says. I'm going to write notes or I'm going I'm to text somebody on my cell phone. You know, one of, the, one of the greatest hindrances to people hearing the word of God today is because they're busy doing something else when the precious, powerful word of God is being preached and taught. And so tonight, I ask for your attention on purpose because this is the secret to knowing how to receive the Word of God. Number one is to be able to want to hear. That's not a point on the message, but that is the first thing you need to do tonight. Now, he answered and said, it's not given unto them to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, here's the way it works. Here's the way it works. Imagine a train. Look up here. I want to keep your attention. Imagine a train going down the track, and uh, the, the train, as he loads up with cargo, the train going down the track usually picks up a few boxcars here, and then he goes on down to the next town and picks up a few boxcars there. And, 
And as that train grows, you go out through New Mexico and through there, you'll see trains that look like they're over a mile long. Man, they've picked up boxcars all over the country, and they're taking them across the country to, to deliver cargo. Years ago, they used to have a caboose. How many people remember when trains had a caboose? How many of you hadn't got a clue what a caboose is? <laughs> the caboose was the little red car. It was the last one at the end of the train, and, uh, and there would be... Uh, there would be one employee usually on that caboose just kind of watch, bringing up the rear, I guess you could say. And, uh, and that caboose was right at the end. And we've all seen the old Western movies or some adventure show where, where somehow the, one of the boxcars or maybe part of the train becomes disjointed and, and some of the boxcars uh, slide off to the back or, or maybe they, somehow that caboose comes unhooked and the caboose just kind of coasts to a stop and the rest of the train goes on. Well, imagine this, it's this way with the Word of God. If you're in the caboose and you get disconnected, you're not hearing the Word of God, you could have stayed attached to the whole train and experienced the whole load of truth. But when that one car becomes detached, look here, that one car slides off to the back and he will never gain any cargo. He won't be hooked to the truth anymore. And that's what happens in church services, in Sunday school classes, or even when somebody's reading the Word of God. Uh, they become disconnected because they don't hear. They're not willing to hear, and they become disconnected. And so in verse 13, well, watch this. Let's read all of verse 12. For whosoever hath, you see that? If you're getting some truth right now, you're in a good position. But watch this. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. What's that saying? If you're getting a little bit of truth, God's going to give you some more. Right? Now let's read on. Look at the rest of it. And he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. There's the caboose. Sliding off to the back, Franklin. There goes the caboose. When you don't listen, you miss out. Isn't that true? And so look at verse 13 now. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they, seeing not, and hearing they hear not, or seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Now, this age in which we live, when Jesus turned away from the nation of Israel, he had offered them a kingdom where he would have been their king at that time. But because they said, no, we don't want you, then that kingdom promised to Israel was postponed and now there is what we call the kingdom of heaven which is an interval between now, between the rejection of Christ and his second coming. He's coming again. We've been preaching on uh, Revelation and some of the prophecies on Sunday night and Jesus will be coming at the end of the tribulation to set up his thousand year kingdom. And that will be the kingdom that was originally promised and rejected in chapter 12 of Matthew. But in between those times, you and I live. And this is a mystery, the Bible says, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now look here. Imagine a circle. And this circle represents all of professing Christianity. Everybody in this circle, would, at this day and age, would be considered everyone who names the name of Christ would be considered in the kingdom of heaven. It's, but the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that names Christ here on earth. And so everybody, the cults are in it, Roman Catholics are in it, anybody who just makes up their own religion and names the name of Christ, if they claim to be a Christian, and maybe they're not even saved, but they're in what's called professing Christianity or the kingdom of heaven. Everybody who claims to be Christian. Now, within that big circle, there's a smaller circle. And that's the kingdom of God inside that. And sometimes these terms are used interchangeably, and so only the context will tell you how to interpret that. But there is a smaller circle inside this big circle of the kingdom of heaven where everybody who claims the name of Christ is in that, but the true believers are in that smaller circle within the big circle. So tonight... And in the book of Matthew, we have a lot to do with the kingdom of heaven. Everybody who is in the kingdom of heaven is not a true believer. Did you get that? Everybody in the kingdom of heaven 
is not a true believer. That's talking about everybody that's walking on the face of the earth right now. And uh, the ones who claim the name of Christ are in that. And so Jesus starts a new ministry of speaking in parable, chapter 13, and he tells us how to understand the word of God. And that's what we're getting at tonight. We don't want to misunderstand, misinterpret, or misrepresent the word of God, do we, in our lives? We don't want to be like the newspaper reporter. I, you've probably heard this, but I want to hear it again. Uh, the Harley rider was riding past a zoo on his motorcycle, and, and he's riding, riding around there, and he sees, the, he sees a big lion cage, and there's a little girl there. Uh, she's leaning over into that lion cage, getting way too close, and, and she sticks her arm up in front of the lion cage, and the old lion just reaches out with his paw and snatches her and gets her by the cuff of her shirt and is trying to pull her over into the cage, into the lion cage. And the Harley rider just stops his bike immediately. immediately. He's just kind of idling by. He stops his bike, jumps off of the bike, runs over there. And, uh, man, the old lion's got his face right up against the bars trying to get that little girl. And that guy just hauls off and wham, man, he hits that old lion right in the nose. And the old lion, man, who jerks back in pain. And, and the bike rider grabs the little girl and pulls her to safety and presents her to her parents. And all oh, those parents are so happy, man, got their little girl back, almost saw her getting eat up. And, and there's a New York Times uh, newspaper reporter there. And he comes running up. He said, man, I just saw what you did. He said, that's the bravest, uh, bravest and most fantastic act I've ever seen in my life. He said, man, you're going to be on the front page of our paper tomorrow. He said, by the way, what, uh, what do you do for a living and uh, what's your political affiliation? And the bike rider said, well, I'm a U.S. Marine and, uh, and I'm a Republican. Next day, the paper came out and it said, U.S. Marine assaults an African immigrant and steals his lunch. We, we don't want to be like newspaper reporters and get the story wrong when it comes to the Bible. So since the Word of God is powerful and quick and the Bible teaches that the, that the Word of God will change us, why is it, listen to me, let me ask you a question. Why is it that some people can sit in the same crowd and some people hear the word of God and it changes them. And other people sit in the same crowd and it does nothing for them. Why is that? It might have something to do with the way we hear. Let me give you four points tonight on the parable of the sower. Number one, the need for a tender heart. We're going to go through the parable uh, verse by verse as we go through these points. The need for a tender heart. Need for what? Tender heart. How many of you have a tender heart? You don't have to raise your hands, but uh, you know, in, in, your, in your own mind right now, would you say you've got a tender heart when it comes to the Word of God? It, can you honestly say that whatever the Word of God says, I believe it. Whatever the Word of God tells me I need to do, I'll do it. I treasure the Word of God. Is that the way you feel? Well, <laughs> there is a need of a tender heart. My subtitle for that point is this, the tragedy of the wayside hearer. Look at verse number 4. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Now, in this parable, Jesus is the sower. Are you with me? Jesus is the sower. He's sowing seed. And the seed is the word of God. It's the Bible. And so Jesus is the sower, the seed is the word of God, and the soil is the heart of man. Everybody has a heart that has the opportunity at least sometime in your life to receive the word of God. So we need to start off asking what, what is meant by the, the wayside? He says, when he set, sowed some of the seeds. Now, the, we know, listen to me. We know there's nothing wrong with the sower, nothing wrong with Jesus, right? He's the perfect son of God. Say amen right there. Uh, the, we know that there's nothing wrong with the seed, the word of God. Isn't that true? And so if there's a problem, it's not with the sower, it's not with the seed, it must be with the soil. And so that's what we're going to look at. What is the wayside soil or the wayside heart? Uh, let me describe the field to you. 
in those ancient fields. The, the farmer would go out and, uh, and he would sow his seed in this big field around the perimeter of the field, around the edge, all the way around the edges is where men have walked. They try to stay off of the center of the field. If you, you who raise a garden, you know the more you tromp around in your garden, the harder it packs the dirt down and, and your seeds don't grow good there. And so people walk around the edge of the, of the field and maybe there's some paths through the field to get from one side of it to the other. And wherever there's a path, the dirt is what? Hard. The wayside, through much trampling and walking, has become packed down. And that dirt doesn't receive the seed very well. The earth is not broken up there, and, it's, and that seed has to have a place to settle down in there, a soft, tender place to sprout and make change. I sowed 50 pounds of yellow clover seed a few years back, bought it out in El Reno, Oklahoma. We were out there, and, and there's a big seed company there. I've been wanting to sow some yellow sweet clover for my honeybees. Honeybees love yellow sweet clover. It stands, it's just an old weed. A lot of places uh, it's declared a weed by the Department of Agriculture, and they try to exterminate it, but the bees love it. In a lot of states, you drive through Colorado and Wyoming, you'll see yellow sweet clover growing on the roadsides, on the road ditches. Just It stands up about this high, yellow, long, yellow tassely blossoms all over it, and the honeybees can make a lot of honey out of that nectar. Well, I, I got 50 pounds and, and uh, brought it home and, and went out there and sowed it over my little six acres. I didn't, I didn't get the ground broken up, though. I just went out and sowed it on top of the ground because people, I had several people to tell me, ah, oh, you just sow that stuff on top of the ground. Man, it doesn't matter. It's a weed. It'll grow anywhere. Just throw it out there. It'll grow. So I took that 50 pounds of seed, and like the sower in this parable, man, I'm just going everywhere, throwing seeds in every place, on the road ditches, around the trees, up the creek banks, everywhere I'm sowing that 50 pounds of seed. They're little tiny seeds, and so lots and thousands and thousands of seeds. Sow them everywhere. Out of all those thousands of seeds, you know how much of it came up? I could count the plants on one hand. <laughs> on six acres, I, might have, I don't think I had one plant for each acre, and it died out before the summer was over. <laughs> you, know what, you know what was wrong? Ground was too hard. The seed was on top of the ground, and it became nothing but bird seed. The fowl came and, and ate it up. That's what he says right here happened. And uh, listen... When we come to church, are you listening to me? When we come to church or we sit in a Bible class and, uh, and our, hearts, our, our, our hearts are packed down hard and we don't have room for the seed of the Word of God, we'll walk out just the way we came in. Still hard. So if we're going to hear and receive a sermon on the Word of God, how do we do it? Well, we've got we've to do several things. We've got to break up the hard ground before Satan snatches away. That word foul means birds and it's symbolic of Satan. In fact, he later on in the same passage says that Satan comes and snatches the word away. So the word foul there is another symbolic word for the devil. And when people come to church, you know what the devil wants to do? When you're in church listening to a sermon, the devil wants to come and he wants to hop right up on the pew right behind you and when you hear the word of God he wants to reach and snatch it and get it away from you before you have time for it to do anything. The devil wants to get you distracted. He wants you to think there's things that's more important than listening to the word of God and he'll get you distracted and a hard heart will be distracted. It's a tender heart that stays open to God. Now let me give you some things you may want to jot these down. If you want to keep a tender heart that hears the word of God, number one, recognize Jesus as your Lord and master of your life. You want to have a tender heart? You've got to say, I put Jesus first. Matthew 6, I say it all the time. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When? First. And all these things shall be added unto you. So first of all, recognize the Lord as number one in your life. He's more important than your friends. He's more important than your, than your money. He's more important than your fun. Did you know, listen, you know, Jesus is in your holiness than he is your happiness? Yes. Number two, to break up this hard ground, pray before hearing a sermon. Why? so that God make your heart more tender. That prayer will be like a plow 
or a disc on a tractor. It'll break up your heart and make it tender to receive the Word of God. Pray before hearing a sermon that God would make your heart tender. Number three, come expecting to receive from help, some help from the Word of God. Have you ever been somewhere to hear a sermon and you didn't have a clue when you went in that you were going to get anything? And sure enough, you went away without anything? <laughs> If we go expecting, well, I hope you write that. I hope you work, write that word down. If you don't write the whole point down, just at least write the word down in your Bible in Matthew three. Expecting, expecting, expecting. If we go expecting something from the study of the Word of God when we sit down to do our Bible study or our devotion time, well, we ought to sit down and read it, looking for something, expecting that God's going to give us something. Number four. Or what? Did I, yeah, it's number three I gave you, wasn't it? Number four, value the word more than your own opinions. Why do we, why do we have a hard heart that doesn't receive the, the teaching of the word of God a lot of times? Because we have opinions that we value higher than we do the word of God. Got my mind all, already made up, preacher. You can't change it. I know what I believe. Don't you be spouting Bible at me. <laughs> Number five, breaking up this, talking about breaking up this hard ground so that we can learn and receive the word of God. Take some notes on the thing God impresses upon your heart. While you're hearing the sermon or while you're studying the Bible or while you're in a Sunday school class, take some notes. I, I, love, I love using a computer. I, I do my Bible study on my computer most of the time and and, uh, and, and, and I've got a window there where right beside of each verse where I can type in any thoughts that the Lord gives me when I'm, when I'm studying or reading the Word of God. And I can just type those things in because if you don't, what's going to happen? What do we say? The fowls are going to come along on that hard ground and snatch it away. The devil doesn't want you to remember what you heard at church. And so if we make notes as we hear the Word of God taught or while we're reading it, make some notes, then tomorrow you can remember it. Which brings me to point number six. Review what you've learned daily. Review what you learned in a sermon daily or from a Bible study. If you'll review, if, if God gives you something, you say, well, I can't memorize a whole sermon. I can't either. Uh, but if, you, if God gives you some thoughts along the way, if you commit them to paper, they're more likely to be there when you want to study them tomorrow. And if you look at it again tomorrow, look at the points that God brought to your mind while you, was here, while you were hearing the sermon. And if you review those for seven days, it's more likely to take root before Satan snatches the word away. Number seven, to break up this hard ground, fallow ground, put the word into practice immediately. Apply it. You just say it that way. Apply the word. When the Bible is taught, so let me ask you this. <clears throat> Anything that you hear tonight, when would be a good time to put it into practice? Tonight <laughs> and tomorrow morning and every day. And when, when we hear something that's helpful to us, if we apply it, if a preacher preaches on prayer and uh, we learn something about prayer that we, that we need to incorporate into our life, if we say, well, that's neat, that's a good thing to know. But if we don't start doing it, we'll probably forget it. Hello? Number two, big number two. The need for a consistent character. Matthew 13, 5. Let's read it. Some fell upon stony places. Some what? Seed. What's the seed? The Word of God. And so some seed fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up. They sprung up. They sprung up. They sprouted. <laughs> because they had no deepness of earth, and when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. So some of this good seed, again, if the seed is good, right? The sower is still good. So nothing wrong with the sower or the seed. 
It's sowed on a stony place. Now that doesn't mean that there's a few rocks mixed in with the soil. Lloyd Airy, the father of one of my best friends growing up, he had an old garden that had rocks as big as a baseball or big as your fist all in his garden. But he always had a good garden because it had lots of deep dirt between those rocks, plenty of places for the roots to go down and get deep. What the Bible's talking about here in stony places, some fields would have, just beneath the surface of the dirt, would have a big sheet of rock under there. It's like a big slab, like a big marble slab, a little dirt on top, and uh, it had enough moisture in it. When the seed was scattered on top, the seed would sprout, and then suddenly the sun comes out. What does it say? It's scorched. And so the sun then sucks that moisture out of that little dab of dirt on top of that sheet of rock, and then what happens to those seeds that sprouted? They wither. They dry up. I can tell at my place where we've got rock on most of our place about three feet, two to three feet under the surface of the dirt. And I know because we've dug holes there for septic systems and stuff, and I know how deep it is. And it's, it's boy, once you get down there, you're on solid rock. And there's some places where, for instance, I planted a couple of cherry trees and another peach tree and some fruit trees, and every year that thing would die. I got to thinking, what in the world is wrong? Why can't I grow that tree there? And uh, after a little probing, I found out the rock is closer to the surface there, and there, in the dry weather, those young fruit trees would die right there. So the rock was real close to the top of the surface of the ground. It looks good, the dirt looks good, and dirt is good right on top. There's just not enough depth. Stony places. That describes the stony hearer and what we need is someone who is consistent not just spring up and then wither that kind of a hearer one who doesn't wither after he gets started in the word this is the person who only sees what's directly in front of him and he's excited for a little while and then he fizzles out he jumps on board and they praise the Lord, praise the church, praises the people, praises the preacher. Everybody's wonderful. And then some sun comes out and begins to scorch just a little bit. And because he hasn't got much depth, hasn't learned to be consistent in his life, doesn't have much character, and then the sun comes out and it gets a little hot for that Christian and he just folds up and he's gone. <laughs> what one preacher called them was Alka-Seltzer Christians. You know, they fizzle real big for a little while and then they just fizzle out. <laughs> Alka-Seltzer Christian. That's a superficial, write this down. He's a superficial hearer. Superficial means just on the surface. And just below the surface, there's not much there. This kind of a person gets, a, gets an idea of what they think life ought to be and then circumstances don't match that picture of life and things go sour on them. I said, man, this is not what I thought it was going to be, being a Christian. I thought everything was supposed to be rosy. I thought if I listened to a sermon or two, everything would be all right. I thought if I started tithing, I'd be rich. I didn't know I'd go broke. I thought if I started doing something like soul winning, if I went out to be a soul winner, I thought if I obeyed the word of God and went to win souls, I thought surely everybody would get saved. I didn't know somebody would shut the door on me. And so everything goes good just for a little while and they just kind of fizzle out. Well, this is one who becomes disillusioned and discouraged and then they're just a superficial hearer, not much depth. You know, I, I really, I've come to a conclusion after observing uh, ministry for several years now. I've seen so many people come through our doors and not just this church, lots of churches. Uh, people come through the door, and man, they are a flash in the pan. They're excited about everything, and then a few things don't work out, and man, they're gone. I've had people come in and say, man, preacher, that's the best preaching I've ever heard. You're the best preacher. And boy, when people start telling me that, I start getting nervous because it's not long. <laughs> it seems like the folks who say that is not long till I don't see them anymore. I've, I've talked to people who, who, uh, who said, man, I really love the church, and I really love you and love your wife, love the, love the people, love this church, love the music, uh, but then they're gone. And I go and talk to them and say, what, what's wrong? 
Well, it's not you, preacher. I just want you to know, I, it's not you. I love your preaching. Well, is what is it? Is it somebody in the church? Well, not, is it somebody made you mad? No, no, nobody made us mad. It's just, we love the church. And I said, well, is there something about the music? No, no, music's good. And what is it? Well, just, just, we just don't feel like we're going to go there anymore. I said, what? You love me. You love the people. You love the music. You love the preaching. I wish you didn't love me so much. Maybe you'd stay. <laughs> what's, what's happening? I believe that a lack of... Here's, here's what I've observed. I believe it's a lack of character that people can't get in a place and stay put and put down some roots. I wish somebody would say amen. I wouldn't feel so lonesome. <laughs> people just don't. Jimmy and Brenda have been here since Noah's Ark. <laughs> Before Noah's Ark. <laughs> They, just all, that's why we knew something was wrong when Brother Jimmy didn't show up to church one Sunday. We knew he was sick, didn't we? But everybody said, boy, something's wrong with Jimmy or he'd be here. And, uh, and sure enough, he was in the hospital. Folks like that, they just get, they get in and stay put. And, and some of the rest of you, man, this is the Wednesday night crowd. You know, I almost feel embarrassed preaching uh, about this to you because you're the cream of the crop. You're here on Wednesday night. But what happens a lot of times is people... Just because they don't have character, they come in and they get anchored just for a little while and then something upsets their little apple cart and they're gone. And it's inconsistency, poor character, looking for something new. The new wears off and they're gone. <laughs> and, uh, well, let me give you, to be a consistent here, let me give you a couple things right down under that. Number one, if you want to be a consistent hearer, listen to the Bible with faith. With faith. Does, didn't the Lord say something about if faith is not mixed with the word, something about how it's not going to do good? Remember that? Need to have faith mixed with the word. When we hear the word of God, if something is preached and you don't, you don't quite understand, you say, well, I heard the scripture, but I just somehow I just don't believe that. Can I just tell you that if God said it, it's okay. You may not understand it, but you can still accept it by faith. That the Word of God is right. The Word of God is right. God is never wrong. If God says something, you can just latch on to it by faith and say, I don't understand that, but I'm still going to hang on to it because it's God's Word. Listen to the Bible with faith. Number two, hold on to the Word regardless of emotions. Hold on to the Word regardless of emotions. So many times people are swayed by their emotions. So many people, they look for a church just because they say, well, I just feel good there. <laughs> well, I used to get drunk before I got saved, and I felt good sitting in the bar, but I don't think that's a good place to be. <laughs> How I feel, what does that have to do with it? Shouldn't the Word of God be the first thing? I mean, if you can find a church where you just where you feel like you're going to do somersets all the way up and down the aisle, that's good if you feel that good about it. But if you've got one place that doesn't believe the Word of God, but you feel good there, and there's another place where you don't feel quite as good, your emotions not, don't run as high, but they've got the Word of God, which one would be the better one to belong to? You better stay in the one that's got the truth. Now, if you can feel good and have the truth at the same time, that's wonderful. But how many of you already learned that your emotions will play tricks on you? Yeah, your emotions will play tricks on you. I bet there's people in this room who say, I've cried before and didn't even know why I cried. Huh? Or felt sad before and didn't even know why I felt sad. Well, if you, if you blame that on the Bible or you blame it on the church or blame it on somebody that didn't do anything to you, you'll be blaming the wrong one, wouldn't you? Who ought we to blame? Emotions. We live in a feel-good society. You want me to tell you why some of the biggest growingest churches in America do not adhere to the word of God don't preach it in its entirety why they are growing so fast many of them are growing because people go there and feel good the preacher tells them all the positive steps uh, to, uh, to a pleasing personality <laughs> and, uh, and they feel good and the preacher pats them on the back and says it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter if you're a homosexual doesn't matter if you're a thief it doesn't matter what you are God loves you and everything will be okay well, it's true that God loves you, but everything's not going to be okay if you don't give up your sin. <laughs> Amen. 
And so it ha doesn't have so much to do with feelings. And by the way, if we stick with the truth, sooner or later, I believe the feeling will match the truth. You'll feel better knowing that you follow the truth. Number three, remember that one truth will be built upon another. This will form a consistent hearer. Remember that when you hear one truth, if you grasp that one and hang on to it, then another one. The Bible says line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. That's the way the Word of God works. We gain a little here. But you can't, you can't, if you're going to climb a 20-foot ladder, you can't step on the first rung and then make the 20th one up at the top the next step. Huh? You're going to split your pants. <laughs> and you can't reach that far. So what do we do? We take one step and then the next one right above that and then the next one right above that. And if you keep taking one step at a time, then you'll get to the 20-foot top. And so if you're going to be a consistent hearer, grasp each truth believing that it will build upon the last one and the next one will come. Number four, hold on to truth whether circumstances please us or not. Hold on to the truth whether circumstances please us or not. Why do we say that? Because a lot of people will start their journey with the, with the Lord and believe in the Word and then something they thought everything was going to be a different way and then they give up. What if Job had done that? What if Job had given up? What if Peter had given up? What if David had given up? You know, circumstances don't always turn out the way we thought they would. And sometimes when you obey God, that's just the time when troubles may come. Why? Well, for a couple of reasons. Number one, the Lord tests you. And number two, the devil tempts you. Number five, understand that the seeds are not faulty when things go wrong. It's kind of like the last one, but I just wanted to throw that in there to make it a little clearer. Being a consistent hearer, take the Word of God and incorporate it and stay strong. Keep heading down that study and that uh, listening to the sermons and Bible studies. Just keep going whether things work out the way you thought they should or not, and sooner or later you'll end at the right destination. I like what one preacher said. He said, I don't care how high you jump on Sunday, I'm more interested in seeing where you land on Monday. The, this inconsistent hearer, flash in the pan, Alka Seltzer Christian, takes off running fast, but you know the Christian life is a marathon, it's not a dash. Number three, the need for a separated life, or subtitle, the tragedy of a worldly hearer. The need for a separated life. This is important because the attitude we have about life affects the way we receive the Word of God. Verse 7. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Now if we go all the way to verse 22, he, Jesus gives us the interpretation. In verse 22 he says, He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. There it is. He heard the sermon. He that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And he becometh, what's the next word? Unfruitful. Jesus interpreted the parable to the inner circle disciples that he still had left after he preached out there on, on the seashore. He interpreted this to them later. And what were these thorns that choked out the Bible? Well, Jesus tagged the thorns two different ways. He said first it was the, the, the things of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. The things of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. <coughs> the the fields, <clears throat> it's talking about the kind of a field. You can look at that field where he's sowing this kind of uh, seed. He's sowing the seed out there, and the dirt looks great. Man, everything's smooth. It's springtime. There's no weeds there. The, the ground is just excellent. It looks like it's ready to have the seeds thrown on it. And he did. And then 
just beneath the surface of the dirt. It wasn't rock this time. But the roots of the weeds and thorns were under the surface, and they had a head start on the Word of God. And how many of you who have raised a garden know that when you go into a fresh place, you can cut down all the weeds and all the, all the bushes, you can cut all that out and make the top of the ground smooth and sow some seeds there, and then what happens? If you didn't disc it up real deep and get all those roots out, what, what do those roots do? <laughs> those roots come up in a hurry. I mean, you've got thorns and bushes and brambles growing up everywhere because those roots are still under the surface of the ground and they're still alive and they're still growing. What Jesus is saying, listen, Jesus is saying that the thorns will choke out the Word of God. And underneath the surface of our lives, if we have, if we have an affection for worldly things, it will cause us, if we don't do something about it, it will cause us to see the Word of God is not as important as what those things are. We will cling to the things of the world or the deceitfulness of riches. Brother Larry Stewart stopped in my office today. And uh, Larry goes to, uh, to Brother Dawson's church over at Heber Springs. I knew Brother Larry Stewart in Oklahoma City when we were out there in the early 90s. And uh, Brother Larry's a nut. He knows it. If you're watching by internet, Brother Larry, you know you're a nut. <laughs> He's always joking and going on with me, always doing stuff to, to uh, get a laugh. But he's a good guy, a good Christian. He told me this afternoon in my office, he stopped by to see me, and he and a, another fellow that was with him that goes to his church, and Larry told me his testimony back years ago. We was talking about when we first met in Oklahoma City, and, uh, and Larry told me about what had happened before that. I had, he thought he'd told me before. I didn't know. He said, he said I was saved and going to, a, going to a little church in another part of the country, and he said, then uh, a job came open, and uh, he said, I, I moved to Oklahoma City for my job. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I think I've got this right. He moved, and he said, he said, when I got there, he said, the preacher told me when I, when I left, he said, now you get in church when you get there. And he said, now are you sure this is the will of the Lord for you to move there? He said, uh, you know you're going to have to find a church and get your family in church. Larry said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do all that, I'll do it. And so he smoothed it over and got the preacher off his back. <laughs> you know how preachers are. And uh, so he moved there and he said, uh, he said, I met up some, some friends and some guys I worked with and everything. And he said, man, there was golf, golf courses all over the place. And he said, I love to play golf. And he said, they got me into this league where we were playing, we were play, playing uh, three, three day weekends of golf, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And he said, man, we was having fun. And he said, I got doing that. He said, I played every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. He said, I was out of church in a hurry. And uh, he said, it had been going on for some time like that. And uh, just letting the things of God wither and die. And he said, uh, one day that preacher, my old preacher from the other town, called up and said, hey, my family's on our way through there uh, tomorrow, wondering if we could stop by and take you out, buy you all a meal. And he said, well, yeah, that'd be great. So he said the preacher stopped by him and his family and picked him and his family up, and their kids were smaller at the time, and and so they went out to a restaurant, and, uh, and they're sitting there, and uh, the waitress brings the food, and, and Larry said, man, me and my kids, we're grabbing and grabbing stuff. Man, we're, getting, we're starting to eat. And he said, that pastor looked over at me and said, Brother Larry, don't you think we ought to pray for the food first? And he said, that hit me in the face like a brick. He said, suddenly, he said, I, he said that pack of cigarettes in my shirt pocket, and the food in my hands that I was grabbing and the way I'd been missing church and playing golf on Sunday and he said suddenly it just hit me how far I'd gone he said when he said I felt like a miserable bum he said the preacher kind uh, kind fellow said he prayed a, a quiet and, and a gentle prayer and and uh, then after it was over, we went outside, and after we'd ate, he said, the preacher said, Brother Larry, you're not in church, are you? <laughs> he said, he had my number. <laughs> Preachers can, they've got an extra sense, you know. But 
Mary said, no, I'm not in church. He said, you know what you need to do? He said, there's a, there's a preacher in this town. He said, he said, in the condition you're in right now, he said, you don't need to just go to any church. He said, you need to go. He said, there's a man by the name of Jim Vineyard at Windsor Hills Baptist Church. He said, you need to go to church there. He'll set you straight. <laughs> and, and Brother Vineyard's an old, uh, he's an old ex-green beret, Vietnam veteran, and, uh, and mean as a one-eyed water moccasin. And uh, if anybody could get Brother Larry straight, he, Brother Vineyard did the best he could. And, and Brother Larry's serving the Lord today. But that's his testimony. And these thorns will spring up. Whatever's under the surface will spring up. If you have a love for the things of the world, it won't be long. If you don't do something about it, if you've got a love for the world, what will it do? The cares of the world, the pleasures of the world, the fun things of the world will soon choke out the blessed word of God out of your life and you will have thorns choking out the things of God and you'll be grabbing the food and smoking the cigarettes and and acting like somebody that's uh, a heathen not going to church on Sunday before long if you don't do something about it. And so that, that's the first thing was the, the deceit, the, uh, the worldliness. And then the second thing that Jesus said there was uh, money, deceitfulness of riches. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. There's one of those roots. <laughs> root of all evil, which... While some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Let me just say this, that it's not just millionaires who have a problem with money. Hello? We had a couple going to church here years ago that were poor as Job's turkey. I mean, uh, if, you could, if you could go around the world for 30 cents, they couldn't afford to kiss a hummingbird. Uh, they were poor. I mean, they were just poor. And, uh, but they desired to get stuff and money and they wanted people to help them and we helped them and helped them and helped them and helped them I mean we did all kinds of stuff for this people people in this church uh, many of them are not here now but a lot of the people that's in the church back years ago would remember them and, and helped do all sorts of stuff for them and the time came when they quit coming. I went to see about them, and uh, they sat and told me and my wife that they were leaving the church because we just didn't do enough to help them. I mean, we'd done stuff. We had moved them from apartment to apartment. Taken, they didn't have a vehicle or anything. We've had my truck or other people in the church take their truck and move these folks time after time after time. We gave them, we gave them appliances, we gave them furniture. My wife's gone and bought groceries and took bags of groceries and set them on the counter and even helped them prepare the meals and made out menus to show them how to, how to budget the food and make it work. And, and we've given them money and helped them all kinds of stuff. I mean, all kinds of stuff. And they sat there that day and said, y'all just don't do enough to help us. My wife burst out into tears. And she said, I can't believe this. She said, we've done more for y'all than any people in the whole church. More for you than anybody. And uh, she, she was hurt because she, she said, I want you to know my husband. Is, and she started naming off the things that we'd done for them. And they were poor. But you know what? They had their heart and their affections set on money and things. All they could get. They wanted all they could get can all they could get and keep all they could get. So it's not just rich people that have a problem with being lured by money and things. Number four, I'll give you this one, we'll just quit. I won't elaborate on it. The need for a harvest. Number four, this is the this is the good hearer, the godly hearer. Uh, verse number twenty three. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, and some sixty, and some thirty. Good Bible preaching connects with godly Christians. Good godly Christians, they grasp it, they get it, and they bear fruit. Notice that 75% of the hearers did not bear fruit. 25% got it. 75% didn't. 75% 
in this parable. Let the word of God fall by the wayside or got choked out. But the ones who received it ended up being fruitful. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, the apostle Paul said, I have planted, Apollo watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, nor he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. There's fruit in this life and fruit in the life to come. There are varying degrees of fruitfulness, but if we accept the word of God, make it work in our life, put it to work in our life, use it, listen for it very carefully, and hold on to it, it will bear fruit in our life. It's good seed, and Jesus is the good sower. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the way it touches our hearts. I pray that our hearts would be tender when it comes to listening to the word of God. And Father, I pray that as we read it in the morning and in the evening, whenever we read the Bible, I pray that we'd treasure it like gold and silver and precious jewels. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to treasure the word of God and, and let it work in our lives so that we bear fruit. Lord, we don't want to be unfruitful Christians. Bless the invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. 